Mark 1, verses 21 through 28. But before we can do that, we need to discuss what we talked about last week because context is so extremely important. And last week we covered Mark 1, verses 15 through 20. And it's in those verses that we're told that Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee after John the Baptist was arrested. And Jesus begins his ministry by doing what? By proclaiming the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand because the king has arrived physically in human form. The very king that the Old Testament has promised is now here. And that's what Jesus is proclaiming. I'm here. The king in human form. But this wasn't just about the physical kingdom of God being at hand. Jesus is also advancing God's kingdom spiritually in the hearts of all those who believe. As sinners place their faith in Christ, they're removed from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God ruled by Christ. For those who place their faith in Christ now serve the king in his kingdom, no longer serving Satan in his kingdom of wickedness. Now, how does that come about, church? How does one become a servant in the kingdom? There's only one way. There is only one way. By following Jesus and his commands, when he said, repent and believe in the gospel. This is the greatest news that we will ever hear. Because every single one of us, all of mankind, has broken every single one of God's laws. If not physically, then at least in your mind and in your heart. We are all thieves, liars, adulterers, murderers. We've all taken the Lord's name in vain. We've all worshipped false idols. So every single one of us deserves the wrath of God. Every single one of us deserve His torment. However, we serve a gracious and merciful God, the Father who sent His only begotten Son, who revealed Himself to us here on this earth. But what else did He do? He lived the perfect life and became the perfect sacrifice on every single believer's behalf. It was our very sins that nailed him to that tree. And while he was dying in our place, he even received God's wrath that we deserve. This is what our Savior did for us, the fallen, wicked man. But he didn't just take the sins of God's people. No, He also imputed His righteousness to us. We are no longer a sin-stained human, but now we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And I love how Mark writes, because then he immediately jumps into him going and recruiting his disciples. Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee. And he sees the brothers, Simon and Andrew, fishing. That was their career, a very successful career. Where did that come from? Mm. A successful career, and they made a great living at it. And Jesus looked at them, and what did he say? Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. This wasn't a question. He wasn't asking them to follow me. This was a command from the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's telling them to abandon everything, not just their earthly jobs, but all other masters as well. And you see these brothers, they did exactly that. Now Jesus goes a little further, and he comes across two other brothers who also were fishermen by the name of James and John. They were mending their nets, getting ready to go back out. 
And he says the same thing to them. Again, not a question, but a command from the king of kings. And they do the exact same thing. They lay their nets down. They tell their dad, thank you for everything that you've done for us. But I believe you and the servants got this from here. Why do I say that it is a command and not a question? For when you have the Lord Jesus who frees us from our bondage to sin, he paid that price so that we are no longer a slave to sin, but now a slave to the king. These fishermen never had a chance to deny the one who rescued them. For they had been chosen to spread the gospel and in doing so, advancing the kingdom of God. Mark 1, verse 21. And they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Now they is, of course, referring to Jesus and his newly recruited disciples. Capernaum means village of Nahum, which more than likely is in reference to this being the hometown of the Old Testament prophet Nahum. But even the word Nahum means compassion. So it could be named that it could be named after the residents and their compassion for one another. We're, we're not certain. But this was a prosperous fishing town located at the northwest edge of the Sea of Galilee. This is a location where Peter, Andrew, James, and John's fishing operation was located. This is also the place where Matthew, the tax collector, worked. Once Jesus was rejected in Nazareth, Capernaum would become the headquarters of his ministry while in Galilee. Now, just a little side note on the word synagogue. The Greek word translated means gathering or assembly. And the synagogue actually started during the 6th century B.C., during the uh, Israelites' Babylonian exile, which lasted 70 years. Babylon would be invaded by the southern kingdom. From there, they would be enslaved. But prior to that invasion, where they worshipped was the temple. Now, the temple was going to be destroyed during that invasion. But even if the temple was still there, the Israelites were going to be enslaved for 70 years. So what did they end up doing? Because of their enslavement, they began to meet in small groups. After they were freed from Babylon after that 70 years, they returned back home, rebuilt the temple, but they continued to meet in synagogues. Now, the synagogue could be a place where the village would worship locally, a meeting hall, school, a courtroom, didn't matter. But a synagogue traditionally could be formed at any place as long as they had at least 10 Jewish men gathered. Now, one of the primary functions held in the synagogue would be the reading and exposition of Scripture. Extremely important. And any qualified Jewish man would be able to read and exegete the word. If there was a visiting rabbi, they would be given the opportunity to read and teach. And this is what happened with Jesus. Jesus was viewed as a rabbi. But also, this is something that Mark hasn't told us yet, but Jesus had already been performing miracles. So when Jesus comes to town, you know these people are going to want to hear from this man. They've heard about the miracles that he's been performing. So yes, they were going to allow him to preach and teach. So Jesus shows up at your synagogue. Yes, you have a place. Look at verse 22. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. We're not certain what Jesus was preaching on that Saturday because Mark doesn't tell us. Instead, Mark focuses on what? The reaction, the people in that synagogue. He says they, they've never heard anything like this before. The, the authority with which Jesus spoke, it was clear, it was powerful, it was confident, there was conviction for their hearing the word being taught by the divine king. 
people in the synagogue that day, they knew they weren't just hearing from another man. There was something different here. Again, precise and authoritative. Now, overall, this was different from what they are used to hearing. And this is what I mean. The scribes were the main teachers in the first century Jewish society. You can trace the scribes back to Ezra and Nehemiah. They were responsible for reading the law and explaining it to people. Over a period of time, though, the scribes would also be referred to as rabbis because they were reading and teaching so often. And just so you know, the word rabbi means honored one. But something happens, sadly, over the centuries, from the time of Ezra to the time of Jesus, the scribes got away from exegeting the text. Sounds familiar, does it not? They began teaching on different philosophical ideas, obscure insights, mystical beliefs, or imaginary allegories from other rabbis. So they abandoned the word of God and started focusing more on a tradition that other rabbis had taught. But not Jesus. He didn't focus on that nonsense, didn't rely upon what other rabbis had taught. Instead, he went back to the word with authority, clarity, and precision. And the people that day were amazed. They were amazed that Jesus was preaching and teaching the Word. Think about that. And you can picture the synagogue hanging on to every single word of Jesus. But that profound, mind-blowing teaching moment would soon be interrupted. Look at verse 23. And immediately... There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Now this sounds out of place, doesn't it? A, a demon-possessed person hanging out in a synagogue? But think about what has happened to the Jewish faith in the first century. It's been corrupted. It's hypocritical. It had become a false religion based upon a works-based salvation. Listen, they're no longer holding to the word. It's based on a tradition. It's driven by more of the religious leaders' laws, commands, and tradition than by the word of God. It's a perfect place for a demon to linger and continue to push false teachings. The demon would have been comfortable in a place that doesn't hold to God's word. A place where God's word is twisted. A demon will feel at home when the religion has been tainted. So they're able to hide themselves in this false religion. If you will, look at what Je Jesus said about the religious leaders, that being the Pharisees in John 8, verses 44 through 45. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. This is the reason why the demon was able to remain in the synagogue where the word wasn't being taught. That was until Jesus comes in, starts preaching the truth, and what happens? The demon is forced to cry out. Now, before we move any further, what do we know about demon possession, that being based on Scripture? Overwhelmingly, just about all demonic possessions take place in the New Testament. I'm not sure where many of you all stand where it comes to the Nephilim in Genesis, or depending on 1 Samuel and the harmful spirit tormenting Saul. 
But, but outside of that, no mention of demon, demonic possession is in the Old Testament. The rest takes place in the New there are two mentions of demon possession in the book of Acts and numerous ones throughout the Gospels during the time of Jesus' teaching. Why is that? It appears the reason why we see so many demonic possessions during the time of Jesus walking this earth is because the demons wanted to stop this. They, they wanted to stop God's plan through the Messiah being sent. And one of the questions that's asked so often when we cover any type of scripture when it comes to demon possessions is, can a demon possession take place today? I don't see any evidence of possessions ceasing anywhere in scripture. So do I think that demon possessions can still take place today? Yes. Unbelievers, that is. And I say that because of 1 John 4.4. 4. I do not hold that a believer who has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them can be possessed by a demon. In 1 John 4.4, 4, look at what it says. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. For he who is in you, O believer, is the Holy Spirit. And he is greater than he who is in the world, that being demons and Satan. Okay, back, back to the synagogue and what's taking place here. Jesus is teaching the word. He's exegeting the word. And this demon cries out, interrupts the service. Look at verse 24. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now this demon is speaking on behalf of all the other fallen angels, which is why we see the plural being used, us. The demon uses the insult that religious leaders used when talking about Jesus, that being Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of this small, little, obscure, hick town. There's no way the Messiah could come from a place like that. So you see the demon trying to insult Jesus. However, however, the next name he uses is what? The Holy One of God. It goes to show, of course, the demon knows exactly who Jesus is. For this very demon was an angel at one time who was around the Holy Trinity. This demon, along with all the other ones, knows God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit personally. So this demon affirms that Jesus is the Holy One of God in the synagogue. He knows that Jesus is is divine. He knows the authority of Jesus, which is why he cries out, have you come to destroy us? For the demons are aware that they are irredeemable. There's no chance of salvation for them. For they know there's going to be a day when God's perfect wrath and judgment is going to fall upon them and they'll be cast into the lake of fire. They know that day's coming. And here Jesus steps into the synagogue, starts preaching. The demon is freaking out now. Is this the day? Is this it for me? Maybe I can throw a small little insult just to get a jab in. Oh, holy one of God. The seaman recognizes Jesus and is terrified, terrified of him. For this demon has been exposed. That's what the authoritative words of Jesus did. It exposed the demon hiding in a hypocritical religion. Look at verse 25. So you picture this demon making a scene. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. 
Now, who, who knows the sounds that the de- this demon was making? I, I, I guarantee you it was terrifying. Everyone else in the synagogue, I'm sure, was beside themselves. They're asking, what's going on here? But not Jesus. Look at how simple this was for him. Be silent and come out of him. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it? J- just like that? Here's something else that we need to understand. Now, we are aware that Jesus gave this ability to the apostles, and they were able to do the same thing. If you will, go to Luke 9.1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So the apostles were given this gift, this power. But apart from Jesus and the apostles... Nowhere in Scripture, as believers, are we taught to exercise demons. We do know from Scripture that when some non-apostles tried to exercise a demon, it did not turn out well for them. Acts 19, verses 13 through 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying... I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? It's probably something you don't want to hear. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Awkward. All the way around, from beginning to end, just awkward. Now back to the synagogue with Jesus. Jesus said to the demon, be silent and come out of him. I want you to notice something. Notice that there's no ritual or no special formula going on here. No certain garments are being worn here. As believers, we're not called to engage in exorcism. You know what we have been called to do? To evangelize. To take the word to the lost. And when a non-believer hears the gospel and places their faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit washes them clean. The Holy Spirit dwells within them and evicts a demon if one is residing in them. Back back to the synagogue and everything that's happening. We first see the command of Jesus telling the demon to be quiet. This wasn't just to silence the loud noises that he was creating in the synagogue. Jesus also told the demon to be silent, forbidding him to speak about him. Jesus didn't want the demons speaking his name. He didn't need a single thing from them. For the religious leaders will begin spreading lies that the only way Jesus was able to cast out demons was through the devil or demonic powers. So Jesus silenced the demons from even speaking his name. And then the second command, come out of him. It's amazing. The demon did both just as he was commanded. Look at verse 26. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. The demon wanted to control this man, to keep a hold of this man, to keep his soul captive. But the demon didn't stand a chance against the king. The demon made one final protest before he was forced from the man, proving that the fallen angel cannot compete against the words and the commands of the Messiah. Jesus dismantled the demon with nothing more than words. 
And just like that, the demon's gone. Now what's interesting, and if you notice, we're not given any information about this man. Why is that? Because it's not about him. It's not about the man who was exercised. It's about the one who exercised the demon from him. Church, it's always about Christ. That's what the scripture does. It points us to him from Genesis to Revelation. It's about Christ. Now the people were blown away by this. First his teaching. And now they just witnessed him exercising a demon. Who is this man? Verse 27. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him? I don't know what else we should expect from the people in the synagogue that day. They were amazed by what Jesus did. They'd never witnessed anything like this before. Not just his preaching and teaching, but also what took place. This was exciting. Caught their attention. But what started out as excitement eventually turns to opposition. This will become an issue for the religious leaders as they begin to question Where is his authority truly coming from? And sadly, with that questioning, it begins to filter down to the Jewish people. Church, this is one of the reasons why it is so important to exegete the word of God. Because we notice that when the people got away from the word, they were being removed from the Messiah, from the King of Kings. They were now listening to different philosophical ideas that some rabbi may have had 10, 20, 30, 40 years before them. Verse 28. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. And something like this happens, of course the word is going to spread. It's the way he preaches. It's his miracles. Even able to cast out demons. When we look ahead to Mark 139, this continues to happen. He continues to go into synagogues, teach and preach, and cast out demons. The demons recognized him, and they were petrified. The crowd saw this, and they were amazed. So you have the demons who know who Jesus is. They believe in Jesus, but they can't be saved. And then you have the crowds who were amazed in what they were hearing and what they were seeing. But the majority of them refused to believe. And that's just it, church. It's not enough to just be simply amazed by what Jesus did. Or to be curious about who he is. He wants the sinner to know that they have broken his father's laws. They want the sinner to fear him as judge. And it's then through that belief that they run to him as Savior. It's at that very moment. Every single sin of theirs is forgiven. If you're a believer in here today, 
This is exactly what has happened to you. You've come to recognize who you are apart from Christ and the sins that you committed against God the Father. And it breaks you. It breaks you because you finally see who you truly are in your fallen state. But once again, this also shows the love and compassion of God the Father that He sent His only begotten Son to redeem you. There is no sin too great that you have committed that the blood of Christ does not wash away. We probably don't do this enough, but there's, if there is anyone in here today that that is struggling with this, please do not leave this building without talking to an elder or another believer. I beg you, because it is the greatest gift that you will ever receive. But on top of that, listen, O church, this is something that every single believer, this is something that we all need to be better at. We profess that this is the greatest news that we have ever heard. And if it's the greatest news that we have ever heard, then why aren't we talking about it more? You know, it's crazy, is it not? If your favorite college football team, I say that because primarily we're college football fans here in the South, not NFL. You can be NFL too. But, but, but it's crazy, right? I mean, if, you're, if your college team wins, you're, you're making phone calls. Did you see that play? Can you believe what happened? Or if they lose, you're probably calling even more people, right? But regardless, here's the thing. We get excited over something like that. But the greatest gift that we have ever been given, what are we, what are we doing with it? I'm, I'm confessing to you right now, I'm, I'm repenting right now that I'm not doing my job in that area. I'm not. I had that opportunity on Friday night. I'm not a country music fan, but I was invited to a con country music concert. 10,000 people surrounding you. And I'm telling you right now, I'm, I'm not a prude, but the way people are dressing now, it blows my mind. I'm astonished from 12-year-olds to 60-year-olds. I had plenty of opportunities that night to talk to people, and I didn't. So I want you to hear me saying that I'm sorry as an elder at Christ Reformed Church that I haven't been doing the job that I should be doing when it comes to evangelizing. From this day forward, I promise you guys, I'm going to try and do better. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father God, just once again, so thankful for this opportunity to come and dig into the Word, your holy, inerrant, infallible Word. So thankful that you have revealed this to us. So grateful that you have regenerated our hearts so that we would believe this truth. can't get over your grace and mercy upon us that you would send your only begotten son. But we're so thankful for it. Lord, I pray that as a church, though, that Christ Reformed Church is known as a church that shares the gospel, that brings this light into the dark world. 
pray to be bold, to encourage, and not to be fearful. For there is no greater truth than what you have revealed to us. So let us do as you have commanded and take it to the world. For we say this in your son's holy name. Amen.